I'd like to welcome you to this morning's Visiting Scholars Lecture. Felby's proud and excited to provide an extensive lineup of programming as we continue into this fall semester. Later today, we'll welcome Dr. Jose Luis Castañaga Ponce de Leon for this year's Hispanic Cultural Heritage Month Lecture. Next week, we also look forward to welcoming former professor of communication and founder of the Villanova Cultural Film Series, Joan D. Lynch. We'll discuss her new novel titled Women of the Passion. Information on these and all other library events can be found on our website, library.villanova.edu. This morning, we're very pleased to welcome Ambassador Thomas Malady, PhD, and his wife, Margaret Malady, PhD, to discuss their recently published book, Ten African Heroes, The Sweep of Independence in Black Africa. The book documents their personal experiences of a turbulent time in African history, when ten men chose a nonviolent approach to creating change and seeking independence. A book sale and signing will also follow the presentation at the table just behind you by the entrance to our lounge. Please welcome Ambassador and Dr. Malady. Thank you very much. In coming here this morning, uh, it brought back memories, just spent a couple of minutes on that, uh, when we were driving from Connecticut with our 17-year-old daughter, Monica. Uh, she looked around, visited various campuses, and told us that Bill was the place she wanted to go. And so she came here uh, in 1987, and uh, this is where she met her husband. So uh, we're reminded of Villanova. Uh, we go to their home, because there are lots of signs in Villanova. She's now in Washington, D.C., where we live. And uh, uh, we hear about the Alumni Association, so it's always really been a great spirit. But it was evident to us, I suppose if she was here in uh, in 87, it was, it was four years later we were here for the commencement, but the place has grown. We had fairly good instructions. I got a little nervous for a while, but we were going to make it. But anyway, we were here, we were very happy to be here. Um, and we were very happy to talk for a few moments about this book, Ten African Heroes. My wife and I spent some time in Africa. Now, before I was married, I was there. Um, and later, uh, why Africa? I was out of that. And in those days, I was a uh, graduate student at Catholic University. They didn't really have area studies, uh, uh, but I was sort of sort of thing to do. Uh, and so I wrote a doctoral dissertation that included a lot about Sudan. And from that, uh, I first job in what was a technical assistance program for the U.S. government which uh, brought me to Ethiopia, uh, where I spent a fascinating two years with the aid program. And that sort of confirmed my interest in Africa. I so pushed the clock back. Uh, this is about 19, mid-1950s. And uh, we're not here to talk about the history, but you really can't go into uh, fairly uh, contemporary African leaders unless you refer to a little history, a little different from our relationship to South America, our relationship to uh, Asia. Uh, our first contact with Af Black Africa, Africa Sub-Sahara, was because of a institution known as slavery. Uh, and that went on to about 150 some years ago. That came to an end, and there wasn't a total transformation but uh, by that time, there was sort of an interest in Africa, 1870, 1880, and that was because there might be some gold there. Uh, and the explorers went looking. In fact, they thought there was gonna be some gold in West Africa in a country later known as the Gold Coast. They didn't exactly find the gold, they found other things. And this was a period that took us up uh, uh, to the 1920s. And uh, when you thought of Africa, you thought of colonies. Uh, I remember my first uh, passport uh, to Africa had visas uh, French West Africa, and then French Equatorial Africa, and a British area. I had three visas, plus two others. The only two independent countries in Black Africa at the time, on the West Coast, Liberia, 
uh, and the Horn, East Coast, uh, Ethiopia. That changed. In fact, it was a dramatic change, and we try to uh, indicate that in the uh, subtitle of the book, the sweep of independence, because there are all kinds of plans. I mean, there's the plan of 1950, in which a very distinguished British statesman said, that he hadn't become the prime minister to give away parts of the empire. That was Mr. Churchill. And Charles de Gaulle never talked about empire, but he talked about uh, the ideal of French citizenship, and we'll all be French, because you remember that during uh, World War II, when mainland French surrendered uh, uh, to the Germans, the one part that remained faithful to a free France was in black Africa. And so with that building up in the 19, late 1950s, 1960, AFTA became independent. Again, we must take a look at that history because it was the Cold War. And I can remember when, uh, after some teaching and various things I was doing, uh, President, uh, as we say, the, the White House called and I was appointed ambassador to uh, Burundi in Central East Africa. And in getting ready for the assignment, uh, we were interested in some things. What we call the unholy enemy of poverty, illiteracy, and disease. And setting up what we might do. I had been in the aid mission, technical assistance. It became apparent when I was being briefed from the State Department and other government agencies, the CIA and so forth, that the main enemy was the Soviet Union. There was in Africa, not planning to set up sat uh, satellite countries, uh, but if we had a map, to my right, I would say that was Africa, 1965, 66, 67, and a big chunk of land in the central part of Africa known as the Congo, formerly a Belgian colony, formerly the property of the king, now independent. At that time, there was a friend of the United States, uh, so everyone thought, and uh, the responsibility of, the, of, of my embassy in Burundi was to uh, impede the Soviets from sending supplies over the Congo. So we soon found uh, what our mission was. We did have a little time for technical assistance, and that was in Burundi, uh, and that was in Africa. Uh, they did have some bumpy things in the background. And then U Uganda, uh, we had the experience. I was the last U.S. ambassador credit to Idi Amin. It was a pretty brutal experience, mostly for the Ugandans, not so much for us. Uh, and we did a book on it. And the title pretty much tells what we thought. The title was Idi Amin, Hitler in Africa. Wow. Um, but we thought that there were a lot of good things about it and some people that were not quite so well known that we knew personally, and lo and behold, uh, they were passing away. And so we discussed it with the publisher. We had written previously on the books. And he said, you gotta get something uh, on in print. Uh, well, anybody could look something up and find out, let's take I talked to somebody from Senegal, and we mentioned the first president was remarkable, man. He was first of all a poet and a philosopher. It was very tough to get earned doctorate from the Sorbonne. Uh, he talked about reconciliation. Uh, independence, yes, but reconciliation, let's find a way to get there. He was very much inspired by the teachings of Théa de Chardin, a Jesuit uh, philosopher. So may I interrupt right now and just okay. and give a little bit of uh, uh, I've been to my wife's up Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think, first of all, we, we wrote the book because we've written many books before, but we never went back to this early period of the 60s. And, um, and so I said to my husband, you know, this is one area that we've never talked about in a book form before. So maybe it's time, you know, that we put this on paper. So. Um, you know, we actually met during that period in the early 60s. And just to give you an idea of flavor of it, uh, it was a very exciting time. Um, 
a very exciting time, especially to be in New York, where you, know, you had the UN, and you had all these African leaders coming to the United Nations. And they were so hopeful, and they were so uh, enthusiastic about their country and how they could achieve independence. And it was just infectious to, to us. And so we really became very much involved. Um, at the time also, there was an influx of students, African students, who started to come to the United States at that time. And um, many of them came on full scholarships that were offered through official purposes, you know. And, but then others, you know, would find a college someplace and they'd say, well, we'll give you tuition scholarship, but that's all. And they'd have to find their way to the United States. And so we uh, met many of those students, and then Tom became involved in setting up a, a, a new foundation to take care of those students who were, you know, had a partial scholarship or, par or even a scholarship but no uh, living arrangement. So we started to raise funds for that and find jobs for them and um, part-time jobs and housing and so forth. So it was, it was a very exciting time because many of these same students who came here became the core of their independent governments. I mean, they became civil servants, uh, you know, head of the bank, uh, uh, in the foreign service, uh, for their own countries. And so it was a, it was a tremendous uh, opportunity for Americans to, uh, to participate in that whole um, uh, birth of, of nations, you might say. And so we were very enthusiastic at the time, you know, in, in the early 60s. And that's when we started, well, we, the two of us started to go to Africa every year, and we met many of the African leaders, and that's when we became very much involved in, in developing friendships and relationships with some of these African leaders. So when we decided to write the book, we went back into our files, which fortunately we had not thrown away, and they were still paper files, uh, not on um, uh, computers, and we found letters and that had been written back and forth by us to many of these African leaders. And it was fascinating to read them again and to realize how um, their thought processes, and um, as was said before, how they were seeking independence but always in peaceful means. Now, it didn't always happen in peaceful means, and Tom can talk a little bit about that in the Portuguese areas. But, um, but many of them were seeking it through peaceful means, through a very uh, deliberate process, uh, through either the British colonial system and the French colonial system. But when we started to look at all of them as a, a group, we realized that there was an underlying tie, a unity. And that was that many of these leaders had their start because of their early education. And how did they get their early education? It was through missionaries, Catholic and Protestant missionaries. And, uh, and you could see in their, in their formation how that um, the missionary, early missionary education meant so much to them and how many of them, you know, in, as, as the years went on, you could see how that um, philosophy, that early pinnings of, um, of the missionary thought process had become part of their own process. Um, the other thing I, and we can go into that, and one, one example, for example, is, is uh, over in Tanzania, <coughs> Julius Nereri who um, uh, I remember coming and, and saying to us, he says, you know, well, you know, the Peace Corps comes, they come and the aid missions come and they set up their process. The Peace Corps did a fine thing and, and they were very, you know, didn't, didn't require a lot of the things that aid missions do. Aid missions come in and their people stay for two years and they want 
perfect housing and, and so on and so forth, and then they leave. Whereas the missionaries come to life, and they stay there forever. And, and so they were saying, so how, how important that was for them. And, and many of them, when, when we really got into looking at, at aid and distribution of aid, uh, uh, whether it was food, clothing, books, whatever, uh, they would always suggest go through the, the churches, go through the churches, the missionaries, because they could trust them. Um, it was very interesting from that point of view. And it also, you know, I, I think that whole uh, period of time also, many of them ended up going to Europe for their education. On the French side, of course, they ended up going to Paris. Um, if you sort of put it in historical perspective, um, Paris was a very exciting place to be at the time. It was, of course, after that great, during the 20s, but many of them still uh, went to Paris and you know knew that they were coming into a city that that was intellectually exciting for them. And um, uh, for example, Sangor, I mean, found himself with a group of people from the Caribbean, intellectuals, and so that you know influenced him. Um, the poetry, the literature, the excitement of of this whole. Um, interest in um, black culture and how uh, that was an important part of their culture and had to be preserved, uh, even though they were seeking a, an, a Western education. And so there were many, uh, and as Tom pointed out, this was of course in that period of the Cold War where you had a competition between two um, reigning uh, thoughts about um, uh, on society and the and the way society should be organized and so uh, some of those people were very much influenced by communist thoughts and um, and Sangor found himself in that uh, in that cadre of people but at, at one moment he decided that that wasn't quite what he thought would work in Africa. And so uh, he, as Tom said, you know, he became interested in Théa de Chardin. Uh, he became interested in how uh, cultures could meld together or mesh together and, and still be alive. Um, and he was interested in trying to promote African culture, but he did see, uh, he wrote many of his uh, uh, of his poetry and his literature in French. So um, he tried to preserve that and yet um, jump into the next age and, and take on um, many of the aspects of French culture. So how those two work together, and there were, there were certain streams of thought saying, well, that was impossible, you, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, you should be true to your African culture. But he thought that there was a way in which we could all, that we could gain from both of those cultures. So um, it was an exciting period. And now I, I'm, I'm going to turn it back to my husband because, you know, the British side with uh, Nereri, the, 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 the uh, French side with Senghor, they were two examples of how uh, both sought very peaceful means. But in the Portuguese areas, it wasn't possible. So I'll turn that to my husband and he can talk a little bit about that. We saw, you might say, how uh, two great colonial systems saw the handwriting on the wall, namely the British, yeah, namely the British and the French, uh, and went from uh, colonialism to dependence uh, to, yes, oh, independence, or the British, the Commonwealth, uh, uh, not in the beginning independent, but oh, independent states. Queen will be the head of the Commonwealth, and they'll all be independent. They can exercise their individual personalities through their sovereignty. What do you look at the map? Africa map, make the map right here. And then the southern part, there are uh, two vast chunks of real estate that flew the flag of Portugal and the Belgian flag in the Congo. Uh, Belgium 
uh, hesitated, didn't really have a preparation program. It was interesting in the meetings of the memoirs of, of uh, Eisenhower, who uh, wasn't exactly an average person because he was chief of state being briefed, and you might say he uh, listened, and the briefing says you've got to persuade Belgium. Uh, that kind of move up to recognize these, this handwriting on the wall. Uh, they did, uh, not very much preparation. Uh, Portugal refused. And so while we saw over the period of 1960, 61, 62, the map of Africa changed. And it wasn't like having one independent country on West Africa, Liberia, and one on the East Coast, Ethiopia. Quite a few, in fact right now it's 53 sovereign states in black Africa. Um, but the change didn't include that. And the Portuguese held back uh, a lot in, in, on the East African, South East African coast, Angola, and on the other uh, side of the continent, Mozambique. Uh, and they didn't recognize. Uh, they began maybe to expedite some transformation in regard to some schooling, but really not very uh, not fast enough. And so therefore what happened? While uh, leaders in other parts of Africa were talking about independence, through reconciliation, through discussion, uh, in Angola and in Mozambique, they resorted to fighting for it. Uh, we have both leaders in the book, uh, and the uh, other several like in our country. Uh, but one prominent one in Angola was Jose Roberto, uh, who again was a son of Protestant missionaries. Uh, we got his early education. I believe actually they're, they're American Methodists. Although the predominant culture, and you might say religion of Angola, was influenced by Portugal, was Catholic. Same thing on the other coast, uh, uh, Eduardo One Lane, uh, who was a leader of Mozambique, also was tied into uh, uh, the teachings of Protestant missionaries. Uh, and both of them uh, negotiated, organized rebellious groups, and pushed. Uh, there was a change in history. Where did the change take place? It took place in Portugal. Long-time dictator Salazar uh, collapsed that point of the governing structure, and it went to essentially a socialist government, which philosophically, putting it in the sentence, was sent to left, and certainly believed in independence, and certainly did not believe uh, in colonies. So you had in those two pieces of, of, of territory, plus a small Portuguese Guinea on the west coast, a change that was bumpy. Uh, and in the Congo is the one place uh, where we had violence. And as is true in most cultures, including here, people seem to remember the violent periods. And they were very much uh, in the early 1960s in the Congo. But you have to see that violence in terms of the broad perspective. I don't know if anybody here is actually majoring in African studies, but in 1960-61, one of the level of national interest. The uh, uh, Congo had elections, indirect parliamentary type elections, but nonetheless elections. And a young gentleman by the name of Patrice Lumumba was head of the predominant party and under their system became head of government prime minister. And uh, uh, Patrice Lumumba wasn't satisfied with the progress and under international uh, relations, under national law, you might say he exercised what would be the normal authority that he had and contacted another major power, the Soviet Union, and discussed some bilateral assistance programs, uh, which one would say now, as you we step back on the situation, was normal uh, for a sovereign state. Uh, and we had the point where it was known that Soviet troops were flying into, at the request of the, of the legal government of the Congo, uh, to assist the government of the Congo. 
and that's when you were sent for them. And so we were regarded as an unfriendly act and an act of war. And so if you were in the U.S. government that period, 1961, this would be emergency meetings taking place in the White House. Uh, the Soviets pulled back and the troops weren't sent there. But during that period, I mean, the international picture affected the internal picture. And there was a period of extended uh, struggle, uh, which occurred for several reasons. Uh, maybe if some would say it was primarily because they weren't prepared to build a very poor government in terms of saying, yes, one day you will be independent. They forgot that one section of history the Versailles Peace Treaty of 1919. Uh, much to the surprise of many, when they were meeting at the end of uh, World War I, and the usual theory was, the winner gets all, uh, the loser loses all. And you had in Africa, again in my little Maple Leaf map right here, uh, the, the Germans who came into uh, Africa a little late and had uh, uh, German East Africa, now Tanzania, now Tanzania, a chunk of land down in uh, uh, Southwest Africa, and the Cameroons and Togo. Uh, and uh, who was going to get the land? And lo and behold, out of the discussions uh, at Versailles, our president, then president, played something of a role in it, uh, President Wilson. It was said, well, let's, maybe there's a, these countries should begin to look for the long-term future. And that would be, they'd be ruling themselves. And even you heard the word, they'd be independent. And therefore, they weren't assigned automatically to one of the other loyal powers, but became mandated territories, responsibility then of the League of Nations. And the League would say, uh, you have a responsibility here to administer it. Um, and that went on the period of rather, not totally unknown, but relatively unknown uh, part of that history. 1919 to uh, uh, World War II, and along came the uh, United Nations, and they were mandated territories. Well, getting back to the leaders, though, that we wrote about, um, uh, I think that uh, Another aspect that we looked at was the fact that many of these were, they were the first presidents, not all of them, but um, many of them were the first presidents of their country, their new countries, and they were the ones that represented these, the hopeful signs in Africa. They were the first ones, they were the, you know, this was building a nation era. And, um, and again, you know, we looked at it and, and, and looked at our, correspondence and we saw that wonderful hope that many of them had. Uh, some of them, uh, yes. we, you know, we also looked at from the point of view, well, what happened, you know, how did they leave office? And of course, you did have uh, peaceful transitions where, you know, Senghor went off and let uh, another person come off and be elected president. Nereri did the same. Um, and many of them did that, but some of them had violent deaths, and that was another area that was very difficult for us because we knew some of these people very personally. Eduardo Mundelein was assassinated. Um, um, Togo, the leader in Togo, uh, was assassinated. Silvis Olympio. Uh, Silvis Olympio. Tom had to give the news to his son, uh, who was in New York at the time. And it was, uh, the, those were very tragic moments. So, uh, but many of the others uh, left uh, office um, at a time where they felt that they could leave and, and have the country go through a peaceful transition of political power, which we uh, said was part of being a good leader. So, um, but I, I thought maybe, maybe we should stop now and, and if anyone has any particular questions or, or more information about particular uh, leaders that we discuss in the book. Let me say a little story about one, Julius Nereri, uh, who started off life as a uh, 
a school teacher, which was away in Czech Republic, of other, where groups that are not part of the controlling majority climbed the ladder uh, in Catholic countries through the priesthood, uh, and others in teaching. That certainly was true in our own country. Uh, uh, there, when I was in the book, profiles of African leaders. I remember the, uh, thanks to the Spiritans, of uh, American chapter, who now run Duquesne University, I actually operate Duquesne University, and where I got my original uh, inspiration in regard to African studies. Uh, you know, there's a school teacher uh, in Dar es Salaam, and uh, it was the first one from East Africa that went off to Edinburgh uh, for his master's and received his master's. He came back and, and uh, he rose, this is the 1960s, and uh, uh, other things were happening. And there was an independence movement, a political party of the uh, Tanzanians. And it's natural that the man who had his master's, the first one in that country, probably would be elected head of it. And so he was elected head of it and became the first uh, chief of state. Um, he differed from us. Uh, I was ambassador in the neighboring countries so in, in the uh, 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 70s. Uh, he differed from us. And I recall very well, I was sort of a defender. Uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, Ujamaa uh, and family socialism as being natural from the African culture. And uh, he had some questions about capitalism. Well, to some people, well, not all, but to some, he was government circles. I mean, could he possibly be a communist? And so forth. And Ray rejected it. Uh, and Tyler, he was an independent thinker. Uh, well, I was an ambassador to a neighboring country, and he caused a little upset. And I, since people know I know him in the State Department, I was asked for advice. And the upset was, that, uh, in fact, some time, uh, he had invited President Nixon uh, to come. At Nixon, anyway, he was coming to the United Nations as chief of the Tanzanian delegation. And uh, Dr. Kissinger arranged an appointment for him. Uh, he would come out and meet personally with the President of the White House. And let's say it was, it was like on a Wednesday. Uh, meantime, the German government contacted the White House, their chancellor, head of government, was also in New York and wanted to see the president. And the only day he could do it was on Wednesday. So I, Dr. Kissinger assisted the president. Oh, well, we, we can do that. We'll have to move somebody around. Uh, so I, uh, uh, the phone call went to the American ambassador. We informed President Netanyahu that our appointment has been switched until Thursday. At that time, I recall a part of history. I was a member of the U.S. delegation to the United Nations, and I was contacted. Since I knew, we knew him, and we got the Reverend Delegate to ask that uh, President Durari informed Dr. Kissinger that he was very sorry. He couldn't change his schedule. He could not see the president. And uh, uh, my message was, I mean, you better see him. I mean, I mean turning down an opportunity to see the president of the United States. Uh, and, and the reason was most peculiar, uh, uh, they thought, because he had an appointment to see some marinol sisters in Austin, New York. Marinol is an American religious order operating in mostly East Africa. And so I mean, I, not, he wasn't, I know because he's not a bad man, he's, I can't believe it. Why would somebody want to see sisters in preference to the President of the United States? Chief of State and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces. Well, we got the delegate assignment to go to the Waldorf Astoria. I did. I brought my wife along because she just finished writing a book on Senghor uh, and his poetry. And so we went in, and, and as you do, I knew what the assignment was. And so after the amenities of about uh, 10, 12 minutes, and after his friends and first names and so forth, I began by saying to Rachel, say, I'm here under instructions. I think some may be diplomacy. That was to set up a signal. Under instructions from my government. And uh, he looked at me, yes, sir. 
And I said, and that's what I told you now. And he said, yes, they told me all the reasons why he felt uh, he wanted to be thankful. Well, sisters out in the East African coast had learned the local language, first of all, and didn't take, uh, uh, took assignments in sometimes remote villages and were teaching at the elementary school level. And he was very praiseworthy of them. And uh, I remembered leaving him, I thanked them, and I went back to the office of the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, where I was then situated, and I <laughs> made a phone call. And anyway, at the end of that chapter, but that gave me an insight, and that's why I told the story, we told the story in that chapter on uh, Nereri. They indicated a presence, and because we had to get accustomed to the fact that rather rapidly, we had independent voices representing sovereign states uh, uh, speaking to us who formerly uh, were in the colonial system. It took some time to adjust, I would include, uh, that we have, and, and uh, uh, there some changes in the world. Uh, and I think the comment, uh, it had some impetus impact of what's going on in the United States, the Civil Rights Movement. Again, you go back to 19, late 1950s, 1960. Uh, and we were progressing along, and this, in my opinion, helped push it. Because there's nothing like power. P-O-W-E-R. And when the people of color African people and others went on the stage with some power. The ability to negotiate, to give a point of view, and not be from the charity line, not be from the line of independence. That's what it brought us, and it came without chaos. Some bumpy moments that in many ways we of the West were responsible for, yes. That time, the book goes into it, it can't cover everything. Even the fact the, the Cold War period began to come to an end. In fact, you know, I re reread the book. We came in last night, and I suddenly remembered something I should put in the book. And that's when Secretary of State Baker, you know, Baker was the period of uh, Bush one, uh, when uh, in a very uh, frank discussion with the Soviet foreign minister, Serenazzi. Uh, they said, yes, what can we do to push our dialogue up a little? And Baker said, why don't you make some concessions? And, and pull some of your operatives out of black Africa. He said, I will, and you do the same thing. Uh, and we both did. Uh, and so now we're here, we're here at 2011, the world is probably not perfect, but a little more like it should be. That the uh, uh, people in Africa and the third world have a presence. They're at the table with some power and can negotiate. Maybe we should open up for some questions. Anyone have any particular questions? Or? Um, can I ask about bathroom walk? Do you have any comments on the bathroom walk? Because I imagine you were there. In Nigeria? Yes. Yes. Um, we did not include Nigeria in no, include our, Nigeria in the book. any of the leaders. We only included, uh, there were more than, but there had to be personal relationships. Yes. Who people knew. It's not a matter of looking a thing up in the encyclopedia as to when someone was born. So, I mean, that was all available. One of the things are personal comments and correspondence. Uh, Nigeria in the uh, 1960s, uh, Nigeria was as the colonial leopard, or a major chunk of land, and the various parts to it, and part of the British colonial rule was to have it under one administration, acknowledging some differences between North Nigeria East Biafra and so forth, differences in uh, uh, ethnic background and, and in the case of this case, and religion. Um, 
Uh, the people being offered, um, this is a quick summary, I uh, weren't quite happy with that arrangement uh, and sought independence. Uh, again, in a summary fashion, uh, the colonial powers that have facilitated the uh, thing was not receptive to it. Uh, a lot of bleak things were forecast. Um, became a political issue uh, in the, that president's election. Uh, not really differences between uh, uh, Nixon and the Democratic candidate. Uh, essentially, uh, was a little favorable. There were some scholarships given. But you might say in summary in regard to U.S. policy. Uh, for various reasons, including their own interest, uh, they said we're not going to get involved and will not become a patron or a supporter of the Viagra uh, uh, independence movement. Now we can say, well, how is it now? Uh, it seems to have been worked out. Uh, Some of the British are pretty bleak. Uh, they would have been a bloodbath, but we had that term used in the 1960s. Uh, which never happened. Any other questions? Eric, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, it seems from what you said about Patrice Lumumba um, contacting Lumumba. Lumumba, Lumumba, yeah. contacting the communist Russia, and which really upset the uh, CIA and the United States. Um, now that uh, the all the new, I'm sure you heard all the uh, relations between Africa and China and how China is, uh, I mean, they're just playing a big role in, um, in Africa now as well as uh, investment as well. Um, and there's this big debate about, you know, neocolonialism and how is the the United States government or Barack Obama's government, uh, uh, do you think we'll see? I mean, wh what do you think about this whole debate about um, you know, China taking over Africa? Mm -hmm. From the commercial point of view. Yeah. Well, there are varying opinions. I'll summarize them and give them mine. Uh, certainly, China, and I, 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 we have met some of the Chinese diplomats in Africa. Uh, first of all, it's a nation state, and like all nation states, they are promoting their interests, trade and development. Uh, they're pretty long term. Um, I say that you can sit down to, when you sit down to have a frank conversation with the Chinese representative. Uh, they say our way was different. Look what we've accomplished in China in terms of uh, uh, per capita income using the, the, those standards. Uh, it can be regarded as rather impressive. Uh, and that's, I mean, it came right uh, in the chapter on Julius and Rary. Uh, he had uh, not frequent, but contacts. It was sort of impressed with some of their planning uh, and trying to incorporate some of it. I'd say the uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, the communism a la Chinese or Russian, which wasn't uh, marketable, was the part in atheism. Uh, the uh, uh, Africans were sort of a naturally spiritual people, and it was hard to communicate that. Now, what is the situation today? Uh, they have a strong presence in, in all of black Africa. Uh, probably they're the only other major power uh, besides the United States. We have an embassy in every country. That went back to a decision made by President Kennedy. Virtual plan was, I know, was a, I was at the Foreign Service at the time, that there'd be one ambassador for four or five countries roving around, etc. It would save money, among other things. And Kennedy, on his advice, rejected it. And so each sovereign state will get a U.S. ambassador. But the Chinese have more or less uh, said the same thing. In the end, 
I think the African people decide uh, what uh, direction uh, they're going to go. Uh, this is my opinion now. Uh, I don't see them going uh, the Chinese route as presented to maybe some aspects of it. But I think in the end, they will have their own. But I do think I do think that, that what you raised is a very valid point that they are um, negotiating terms with African countries that you know where they have long-term relationships and um, access obviously to uh, minerals and and so forth that um, which is almost the same thing which is almost the same thing as the colonial Europe. power right yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. and so I think that 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 is something you know some of the African nations have to be wary of. You know, what are the terms of these agreements and, you know, how can they protect their, their uh, own uh, valuable resources and yet still uh, market them because they need the revenue for their own country. So, um, yeah, I think that this is a challenge and I probably are, are, you know, American embassies are constantly talking about that in terms of how you know, being thoughtful or, or trying to put forth, you know, thoughtful presentations on how that should be negotiated. Whether we'll succeed or not, I'm not so sure, but the Chinese are very, very uh, adept at that. And um, I think that, you know, we are becoming, you know, it's almost they're, they're one of our, lar they are becoming one of our largest competitors. And look here, yeah. to a student body. Absolutely true. Uh, they have a very active uh, scholarship program uh, with heavy emphasis on their curriculum, which would be a little different model, heavy emphasis on the, ma on the sciences, math particularly, uh, the sciences, physics, chemistry. The challenge is that if you were a 18, 19 year old African student, say in Tanzania or West Africa, the chances are uh, well, not only chance that you saw, certainly you probably know that uh, in French, French speaking with French. Well, they, or, they, they started teaching Chinese in African universities. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree that, the, that there, there is a competition now going on. Uh, and, 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 and an, an American embassy will probably will not seem as it was seen in the 60s. Now it is. Yeah. yeah. Probably not, um, although I, I think one of our, you know, from my observation anyway, uh, that um, um, some of our, we're not as aggressive maybe in the commercial area as we were in the political area in many embassies. Now, that's got to change because obviously commercial diplomacy is extremely important. And I think that's my observation. I'm, you know, totally outside, you know, the, the, the diplomatic core. But that has been my my observation, and I think that's one of the things that we have to become more aggressive about. Looking at the uh, yes, I think we have, a, we have a question back here. Follow up question. Yeah. That other nations besides China are having a, a pervasive role in the today. What are the motivators? Why are these nations? What are they interested in? Well, China and the United States are looking for trade and investments and business. Um, I don't think any of the, uh, the Soviets, when it was the Soviet Union, until uh, uh, the early uh, 1980s, uh, and other motives, which are, they haven't hidden, all you have to read is the end reports of the Communist Party in Moscow, uh, and then where they set forth their goals, and what they thought would be a natural socialist community, accepting their doctrine, didn't happen. Of course, in the meantime, there have been changes in the, in the Soviet Union, no longer exists, we have the Russian Federation. Uh, they're far less aggressive. Uh, have fewer uh, embassies uh, in Africa, sub Saharan Black Africa, uh, than, the, than, than the old days. Uh, and some trade going on, still some scholarships, mainly for the Patrice Lumumba 
uh, University on the outskirts of Moscow. Um, but probably the two major systems are the United States and China. Well, I, I'd also say that the uh, former colonial powers are still very much uh, tied to Africa and, and in commercial interests, the French and the French, mainly the French areas, um, and also um, the British. Um, one of the things that interesting things, and not really in this book, but um, when Tom was ambassador in Burundi, which was a former Belgian colony, mandated territory, um, territory pardon not a colony, um, uh, he, it was very interesting to observe the competition between the Belgium and the French, <laughs> because they were both vying for uh, more political and commercial power. And some of the commercial power, of course, is tied to the political because a lot of it is military. And so the French wanted to sell their helicopters and their whatever, you know. And so the French were constantly there, you know, trying to uh, make inroads, and they did. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd say the French are still very much involved commercially, uh, militarily, uh, and the British the same way. And, One of the, uh, um, I'll just sort of um, uh, close on another thought. Um, going back to Senghor, uh, when Senghor came to the U.S. Um, much later than the, it was what, in the 70s or 80s, anyway, he came to the U.S. and um, um, he really gave a very interesting um, talk about the whole you know, the future of Africa and, and some of the uh, competitive forces at the time. Uh, but he also <coughs> asked for a private visit. It was very interesting. He wanted a private visit to a very obscure Jesuit cemetery on the outside of New York. And it was mainly to visit the grave of Teilhard de Chardin. And he um, came you know, with all the entourage that he had. And, and he came. And we were invited to be with him. We were invited. And he came and he had one rose. And he went to the grave and placed one rose on the grave. And there were photographers. And he turned and he said, I do not want any pictures taken. And he wanted that to be a totally private moment, which was a really fascinating aspect of, of a man who remembered his past in, in, in France and uh, wanted to pay tribute to a person who had actually influenced his thought process. So. In the back of this book, uh, in 1967, an adjunct professor at Porter University, uh, while being full time with the U.S. mission uh, to the United Nations, and I suggested Singar as an appropriate visitor. Uh, I can say now uh, we put in the appendix his uh, speech on reconciliation, which he saw occurring. Uh, uh, and incorporating uh, some of the best parts of negritude, which is his own uh, specialty. Um, and I remember some of the reaction. I didn't bother putting that in the book. Uh, but I remember it was 1960, 61, 62, and in our own society. So we weren't, we weren't quite prepared to discuss any more dialogue and let's see, work things out and move forward. Uh, now the main intent probably was that uh, he gave me in French, did pick up English later. We both spoke French, speak French. And so we tried to communicate what he was trying to say uh, and uh, got him, get him around to the United States. And then if you might say intellectual circles, there wasn't much trouble. But in terms of the mainstream people, uh, including our friends in the civil rights movement, we weren't quite prepared to have that discussion. Yeah. Is there any other questions?
other questions? Um, uh, thank you very much. We enjoyed coming back to the campus. Yes.